All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and start the uh, fourth and final talk for today. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, talking to some of you afterward and uh, had some really neat conversations. Um, after we're done, I'll hang out for a while in the baptistry area if anybody just wants to chat privately with me or what have you, um, kick ideas around, whatever. Um, I'm totally up for that for, for a little while as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and, uh, and begin understanding the sacrament of confirmation. My oldest daughter got confirmed a couple of years ago. My next oldest daughter is in line to be confirmed next year and kind of charmingly and touchingly, my second daughter has asked my oldest daughter to be her confirmation sponsor. Um, it's moments like that where seeing their ability to set aside whatever bickering or disputes they have on a regular basis for finding this deeper underlying spiritual connection are, are a source of great joy. Baptism, the Eucharist, and the Sacrament of Confirmation together constitute the sacraments of Christian initiation whose unity must be safeguarded. The reception of the Sacrament of Confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. In the earliest years of the church, <clears throat> baptism and confirmation were typically um, given at the same time. So one would be confirmed immediately after being baptized. The ordinary minister of confirmation is a bishop. And as the church grew, the amount of travel necessary for a bishop to visit different parishes increased. And so in the Latin church specifically, it became the custom that confirmation happened whenever the bishop happened to come by, whereas baptism would be administered you know, immediately when someone was ready to enter the church. So that led to the separation of baptism and confirmation in the Western church. That said, it makes it easy to lose track of the fact that confirmation and baptism have traditionally been seen as sacraments to be received together as part of the process of initiation. And in the rite of Christian initiation for adults, we've been able to preserve that by the bishop designating priests as extraordinary ministers of confirmation. Uh, but especially for our teenagers, we're all accustomed now to confirmation happening when the bishop happens to be around. Um, and that really has ancient roots in the church. So this um, double sacrament, why, why the distinction? Uh, the Gospel of John records an important episode that helps teach us about this. So in chapter 7, uh, starting at verse 37, we have the following. On this last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and exclaimed, let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. He said this in reference to the spirit that those who came to believe in him were to receive. There was, of course, no spirit yet because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So we saw early in the Gospel of John that from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus had instituted baptism and he had commanded his disciples to go and baptize people. We see here that there was a sense that that baptism by itself was still incomplete, that the gift of the Spirit could not fully be received until Jesus had ascended and been glorified and would then send the Holy Spirit thereafter. And we're going to explore that idea a bit in a few minutes. And so this is what um, led the church from its earliest years to see separately the ideas of baptism and confirmation as two pieces of the initiation but still distinct from each other. Let's go ahead and take a look now, starting in John chapter 16, 
and explore a bit about Jesus' plan for the sending of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, starting on verse 5, we have, But now I am going to the one who sent me, and not one of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I told you this, grief has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I go. For if I do not go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So some observations on this. Jesus is telling us that we have to trust his timing. It's not always easy to understand his plan for us. And at this last supper, as the disciples are conversing with him after dinner, it was not easy for them to understand his plan. John nevertheless remembered it, of course, and you know, wrote down what they discussed. But part of what Jesus is conveying here is that we always have to trust that following his plan somehow leads to something greater. And we see a fulfillment of what was discussed in 739, that after he departs, he will send the Holy Spirit. So, continuing, we have, and, oh, and when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and condemnation. Sin, because they do not believe in me. Righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. Condemnation, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. So what we need to explore here is the purpose of the sending of the Holy Spirit. And part of this exploration requires thinking about what is Jesus talking about with some of his distinctive vocabulary. First and foremost, we need to think about this idea of the ruler of this world. If we look back at chapter 12, starting at verse 31, we have the following. Now is the time of judgment on this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. If we, if, so he's anticipated this idea about this ruler of this world. If we then look at chapter 14, which is earlier in this discourse, looking at verses 30 and 31, we have, I no longer speak much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me, but the world must know that I love the Father and that I do just as the Father has commanded. The ruler of the world is coming. So again, we're left pondering who is the ruler of the world? Ultimately, we understand in the tradition of the church that we're speaking of the devil, of Satan. He's the ruler of the world. Part of what Jesus is emphasizing here is that even though Jesus will be crucified, we should not believe that the devil actually has power over him. He has no power over me, but the world must know that I love the Father and I do just as the Father has commanded me. So the devil ultimately has been condemned and will be defeated. But in the meantime, he is the ruler of the world. And so when Jesus starts talking about the world in this passage, we have to understand that he's talking about how the devil influences the world through sin and how rejection of the world in this sense is a rejection of sin and how the coming of the Holy Spirit gives us the strength and grace necessary to reject sin. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we see that one of the effects of the Sacrament of Confirmation is this. It gives us a special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ, to confess the name of Christ boldly and never to be ashamed of the cross. That's a pretty magnificent set of effects 
I hope you would agree. To be true witnesses and never to be ashamed of the cross. For the cross is something that the world will never understand. Continuing, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. So the Holy Spirit has proven the world wrong with regard to sin. The Spirit guides us into all truth by means of the church that Christ established. Thinking back to the first talk from today. The conclusion then is, if you listen to the voice of the Spirit, he will lead you away from sin. The voice of the Spirit leads you out of darkness into the light. The grace of the sacrament of confirmation assists you in listening for his voice. But listening to the voice of the Spirit is not easy to do. Now, why would I say that? Why is it not easy to do? This is one reason. You know, the smartphone is a miracle of modern technology, and there are many wonderful things about it, to be completely forthright with you all. I even teach a class on how to write apps for it. That's my computer scientist hat. But how easy it is to allow technology and devices and the like to consume all of our attention. This is not a new problem either. In my childhood, there were no smartphones, but we did have a television and we knew how to use it, right? The way of the world is to offer large numbers of distractions that, while not evil in and of themselves by any means, nevertheless can be obstacles to listening to the Spirit. So each of us has out of necessity to make a conscious decision to listen to the Spirit. That requires explicitly finding quiet time or prayer time. If we can make time to watch our favorite television show, we can make time to listen to the Spirit. We can do it. And part of how John shows us how to do it is to give us the prayer example of Jesus Christ in chapter 17 of John's Gospel. When Jesus had said this, he raised his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son so that your Son may glorify you, just as you give him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to all you gave him. Now this is eternal life that they should know you, the only true God, and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. I glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. So that's a pretty awesome passage. He glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work his Father gave him to do. Each and every one of us can glorify God on earth by accomplishing the work he gives us to do. How do we know what that work is? We have to discern it. We have to, in a combination of making time for prayer, reading of scripture, discussion with um, friends and family who are also committed to a life of prayer, in time we discern what we need to do, what God is calling us to do. You know, I, I feel moved just at this moment to talk about how the genesis of this presentation I, I discerned, you know. I, uh, over the summer, was um, thinking deeply about the Gospel of John and my Eucharistic adoration time, and I had a vision of, a, a metaphorical vision, of what John is saying in his Gospel, and I felt a deep desire to share it with anyone I could. And I developed an outline for what the day might look like. And it was kind of on the back burner for a while. And then in December, I had gotten kind of an email on an unrelated subject from, from Christy. 
And I realized, okay, now is the time. And I had mentioned it to my wife and she said, you need to talk to Christy. And so I emailed Christy and we had this meeting in December and kind of to my surprise, by the time I left, this was gonna be on February 8th. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the priests were very supportive of it. And the point is, I went to prayer, I had an insight, and then I shared the insight with others to discern together whether that was what God was calling me to. And through that process, we all discovered that in fact it was. And so here we are. I don't know what that looks like for any of you. That's between you and God. But I am inviting all of you by creating the time for prayer in your life to create space to discern whatever that happens to be for you. It won't look like what it looks like for me or for anyone else. But God's got a plan for you. And there is a work you can be doing that will glorify him on earth. From here then, we have, um, now glorify me, Father, with you, with the glory that I had with you before the world began. I revealed your name to those whom you gave me out of the world. They belonged to you and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you gave me is from you because the words you gave to me I have given to them and they accepted them and truly understood that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. Again, life is rough. There are all kinds of challenges you'll experience in your spiritual life. We need to keep focused on Jesus and the gifts of the Holy Spirit enable us to do that. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for the ones you have given me because they are yours. And everything of mine is yours and everything of yours is mine and I have been glorified in them. And now I will no longer be in the world, but they are in the world while I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one just as we are. We all know that the stresses of parish life are at times greatly opposed to all of us being one as Jesus and the Father are one. As a parish family, we have many great times together and we have some struggles together. But right here, Jesus is saying, don't let any of those worldly struggles interfere with the fact that you are to provide a unified witness to me in the world and that that is your mission. And of course, it's not just our mission as a parish, it's our mission as a church. And it's not just our mission as a church, it's also part of our mission to reach out to, to all Christians and invite them to experience the fullness of what Jesus Christ wants for them in the Catholic Church. When I was with them, I protected them in your name that you gave me, and I guarded them, and none of them was lost except the son of destruction, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. So that's kind of an interesting line. Judas, by his own choice, is not saved. There it is. None of them was lost except the son of destruction. If we don't accept salvation, Jesus doesn't force it upon us. And throughout the Gospel of John, we have seen contrasting moments of this, where some accept what Jesus offers, and others reject it. The story of the woman caught in adultery, again, is extraordinarily powerful in illustrating this. She was caught in adultery. She was a horrible sinner. There's no dispute about that. But in the end, she accepted the salvation that Jesus brought to her when Jesus caused her accusers to depart. The accusers, in turn had an inclination against accepting what Jesus wanted. They were simply there to entrap him. They were trying to trick him. I mean, tricking God doesn't tend to go terribly well, admittedly. But, but there it was. That was their will. That was their intent. We're called here to recognize that if we don't intend to follow Jesus, we're not going to receive the blessings that he's giving us. Continuing then, but now I am coming to you. I speak this in the world so that they may share my joy completely. 
Jesus wants each of us to share his joy completely. I gave them your word, and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. What does it mean to belong to the world? On one level, I absolutely belong to the world. I have a house. I have a job. I have things. Um, I have responsibilities. The real issue is belonging to the world means I'm making the world my highest priority. So if I do not wish to belong to the world, I must seek to put Jesus Christ as my highest priority and defer worldly things as secondary. And he really clarifies this. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So he's not saying that we can escape being in the world until the end of our lives. We're here. That's it. But if we set our hearts on Jesus Christ, the world will not own us. They do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. Consecrate them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world, and I consecrate myself for them so that they may also be consecrated in truth. So Jesus is telling us, I have a mission for all of my disciples, and that mission requires them to remain in the world, but Lord, God the Father, I am imploring your protection for them as they go out into the world. Jesus prays for us. We must be present in the world, but we must not be owned by the world. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So here we see that this prayer is not just for the disciples who are with them, but everyone who believes on their account. And I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be brought to perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me and that you loved them even as you loved me. The world can be difficult. It doesn't mean God doesn't love us. It means he has a mission for us to accomplish in the world. And he prays for us to accomplish that mission. Father, they are your gift to me. We, each and every one of us, is a gift to Jesus Christ. Think about that. Whatever challenges you're experiencing in your life, you are a gift to Jesus Christ. I wish that where I am, they may also be with me, that they may see my glory that you gave me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So this harkens back to the very first chapter. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Righteous Father, the world also does not know you, but I know you, and they know that you sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will make it known that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. So part of following Jesus as a model for prayer is recognizing that we join him in praying for every soul on earth. Jesus Christ loves every single human soul. He's praying for all of them right here. So must we. And what a perspective then for our prayer time. When we set that time aside... We can open this up and just pray right along with Jesus for all of these wonderful things. This leads to our final consideration for today. Who is the Holy Spirit? And the tradition of the church, expounded most eloquently by St. Augustine, the answer to this question is seen in the verse we just read. The love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Following St. Augustine and the overall logic of this entire discourse, we can understand that the Holy Spirit is the love 
which the Father gives to the Son, the Word who was with Him at the beginning of time. The Son, in turn, returns this love to the Father. That's kind of a big idea. Let's, let's think about this a little more. If we go back to the very start of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So Jesus is fully God. And this ultimately leads to the doctrine of the Trinity, which let's go ahead and unpack this a little bit. The formula that we've been taught since you know, our earliest years as children, if we grew up in the church, was that the Trinity is three persons with one divine nature. In light of the introduction to the Gospel of John, we can think of it like this. God the Father from eternity forms an idea of the divine nature, an idea of himself. And that idea, because God is eternal and perfect, becomes the Word, the second person of the Trinity. And God the Father loves this second person, this Word, he has created. But that love in its infinite perfection comes forth as a third person, the Holy Spirit. And that love is returned by the word to the Father. All three of them share a single divine nature. There is only one God. There is only one divine nature. But it's fully grasped and realized by three divine persons all of whom we are introduced to in the Gospel of John. Consider, in light of what I just said, the Nicene Creed. Excerpts from the Nicene Creed. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. That passage is really just the prologue of the Gospel of John stated in different words. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. What does that mean? The Father loves the Son. That love is a person who the Son reflects back to the Father. Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and because the Son returns that love to the Father we have and the Son right there. And all of this is present in the Gospel of John. Right there. Do you have to think hard and pray hard to see it? Well, yes. And part of the beauty of of the Catholic faith is that you're never reading the Bible alone. What do I mean by this? Anytime I open up the Bible, I am reading it accompanied by a cloud of witnesses, 20 centuries of Catholic Christians that came before me and read it prayerfully and wrote down what they came up with and shared it with me here in the 21st century. Truly understanding the Bible requires reading it in concert with all of the people who belong to the church that Jesus Christ established. That's how we can understand the Trinity from the Gospel of John. St. Augustine helps us. It's how we can understand the Eucharist in the Gospel of John. St. Thomas Aquinas helps us. He helps us both by leaving us his writings and he continues to help us in this very moment, by his continuous prayers in heaven at the foot of God the Father. The saints are a cloud of witnesses that on earth bequeathed unto us an enormous spiritual inheritance and continue to bequeath it to us through their constant intercession in the presence of God. 
And St. John, the author of this gospel, likewise is praying with us and for us at this moment. It's a living word he left behind. He left letters on the page, but he continues to pray for us that we might understand it and glean from it that which he wished for us to learn. Could he have envisioned this in roughly 68 AD, which is when I think he wrote it? Well, no. He was writing it at a moment in time where he was faced with a crisis. The crisis was he was the last apostle. Everyone was looking to him, and he knew by himself he could not supply the leadership they thought that they needed. So what did he do? He wrote down his gospel to show the church at that time that they already had everything they needed. In the sacraments that they were already celebrating, they had everything they needed to carry forth the mission that Jesus Christ had given them. Everything. And from heaven, he continues to pray for us. I'm going to bring all of this, all of these ideas from today to a conclusion then. What has John taught us? Each of the seven sacraments perpetuates the gifts that Jesus brought us through his incarnation. What are those gifts? First, to receive eternal life by first freedom from sin, living in the light. The light shines on in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Freedom from sin is achieved through the sacraments of baptism, confession, and anointing of the sick. We also receive eternal life by receiving the food of everlasting life, the Eucharist. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for all of our sins and for the sins of anyone who has ever lived. He, the Lamb of God, offered up his body in sacrifice. And just as the Hebrews offered up the lambs in sacrifice so that they could be set free, so too Jesus Christ offered himself, the Lamb of God, as a sacrifice so we could be set free, and like the Jews consumed the Passover victim, so too through the Eucharist we consume the Lamb of God. Another gift is the gift to know who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Another gift is to live the life God wants of us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our souls, the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was able to send by returning to the Father. How do we receive these gifts? Jesus instituted the visible, hierarchical Catholic Church to give us these gifts. And through the sacraments of both holy orders and matrimony, the Church continues until the end of time. There was a priest I once knew who was fond of saying, matrimony is the sacrament by which all the sacraments continue. Why? It is through matrimony that new souls are born. And those new souls we baptize and bring into the kingdom of God. And through holy orders, the ministry of the sacraments is perpetuated as well. Part of the beauty of today is that in daily life, it's easy to lose track of the good news of the mission of the Catholic Church. But taking a time out, taking a day out to contemplate all of this, we have a chance to see it anew, to see it with new eyes, even things we think we already knew. And so here we are. Well, um, close by mentioning um, some sources that I used in preparing these talks. The Jesus of Nazareth books written by uh, Pope Benedict XVI are his personal reflections on the four Gospels. There may be a touch academic, but they are well worth the effort. I had wished I had read them 20 years earlier than I had, which was impossible since they didn't exist quite yet. 
The book The Lamb's Supper by Scott Hahn is an astonishing exposition of the beauty of the Eucharist. And uh, much of the presentation I gave about the Eucharist, I owe to that book. The book Theology and Sanity by Frank Sheed contains the exposition of the Trinity that I shared with you today. Um, it is, again, well worth a read. I want to extend some thanks to people who made today possible, and then we're going to um, have some question time and we'll close. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Christy Trentina, Father Tony, and Father Jeff for everything they did to make today possible, for the moral and spiritual support they gave, for embracing the vision that I had for this day. I'm going to thank uh, my wife, Karen, who wasn't able to be here today, but who did a lot of work with me helping to envision these talks and these presentations and gave me a lot of valuable feedback in uh, sharpening and improving these presentations. I want to acknowledge everyone who went through the RCIA process here at St. Joseph. Uh, I have learned so much, and many of whom are here today, I have learned so much from every single person who's come through that door ready to learn about the Catholic faith and from the questions and responses from each of you all. Um, I owe a debt of eternal thanks. So with that, uh, as that concludes my presentation for today, I'm going to go ahead and spend some time um, taking general questions up here, and then um, I'll spend some time over in the baptistry area if anybody wants to chat privately afterward or what have you. Um, again, for most of you, I'm a fellow parishioner. Many of you I already know and are friends of mine. Some of you I met today. Don't hesitate to come chat. I love to talk.